Hi, I'm Becca, and this is my husband, Gabe. That's me. Welcome to the podcast celebrating Jack Russell Terrier Dogs. And all the joys of companionship with canines of every kind. Each week, we'll explore all the heartfelt, humbling, and hilarious stories that only dog parents can truly relate to. We're Jack Russell Parents. I don't know about you, but I have times of stress and anxiety. I think we all can relate to that feeling to some degree. Of course. Life is seldom completely free of all stress, and we have to find ways to deal with that. I like to go outside and look at the clouds and the trees, listen to the wind. Me too. Being outside in nature is a major stress reducer, and it helps me clear my mind. I also love sitting quietly and just petting my dog and giving him kisses. Carson has a super smooth coat, and it's so soft, and just petting him kind of helps melt away some anxiety. If you're feeling a little anxious right now, sit back with your pup and listen to our show. Hopefully, petting your furry friend in this insightful, fun-filled show will calm your nerves. Yes, we have for you a super interesting article from AINnews.in called Stress Students Can Reduce Anxiety, Enhance Thinking Skills by Petting Therapy Dogs. And after we learn about this insightful study, award-winning children's book author Kristen O'Donnell Tupp is back in the house to share her new book, Luna Howls at the Moon. Our talk with her will bring you so much joy, I promise. I can't wait, but... Before we get to that, let's uh, do the dogs in the news. Yes. So released on May 16th of this year, a new study has found that college students who are under pressure may bust their stress by spending time petting a therapy dog. The study was published in AERA Open, a peer-reviewed journal of the American Educational Research Association. Sounds legit. It sure does. According to the new Washington State University research, programs exclusively focused on petting therapy dogs improved stressed-out students' thinking and planning skills more effectively than programs that included traditional stress management information. I imagine bringing a a dog in, it's going to just liven everybody up immediately. Even just seeing it, right? Even before you even get the chance to pet it or talk to it, just the sight of a dog kind of lightens the mood. They're just so fuzzy. (laughs) They're so fuzzy. The study demonstrated that stress students still exhibited these cognitive skills improvement up to six weeks after completion of the four-week-long program. So it's a really powerful thing is what Patricia Pendry, the associate professor in WSU's Department of Human Development, said. And I think so, too. I mean... If petting a dog improves your skills or your your concentration, your motivation, all those kind of skills for up to six weeks, that's incredible, right? It's not just just one-time thing. It, it It's long-term. Patricia Pendry also says that universities are doing a lot of great work trying to help students succeed academically, especially those who may be at risk due to a history of mental health issues or academic and learning issues. And this study shows that traditional stress management approaches aren't as effective for this population compared with programs that focus on providing opportunities to interact with therapy dogs. Wow. So there's a lot of therapy dogs. There's a lot of shelter dogs that need something to do. I'm sure they could work out something. Yes. What What a great way to put the dogs to work, right? So Pendry conducted this study as a follow-up to previous work, which found that petting animals for just 10 minutes had psychological impacts, reducing students' stress in the short term. And she also added that students who were most at risk ended up having most improvements. So the students that needed the most help, they were probably the most stressed. I would say, yeah, that makes sense, right? Having some sort of learning issue is going to add a layer of stress to your life already. And the other thing that the article said was that human-animal interaction programs help by letting struggling students relax as they talk and think about their stressors. Through petting animals, they are more likely to relax and cope with these stressors rather than become overwhelmed. And this enhances the student's ability to think, set goals, get motivated, concentrate, and actually remember what they're learning, which is the whole point, right? 
I feel like we don't truly learn unless we remember. Yeah. When you're when you're stressed out, your brain is in that kind of survival mode and it's not really into remembering details mode. That's a whole right. different part of the brain. Right. So so Pendry says that if you're stressed out, you can't think or take up information. Learning about stress is stressful. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I hope we're not stressing you out with this article because I think it's really interesting. It's very inspiring. Dogs <laughs> yeah. are awesome. And animal sessions aren't just about changing behavior. They help students engage in positive thoughts and actions, again, for that long-term effect. So that's the article, and I think it's really incredible. And we don't have to be students for this to apply, right? Other areas of life can be stressful, work, relationships, things like that. So go find yourself a dog or a cat. To pet and get ready for the long-term calming effects. And listen to the music in this next commercial to calm your spirit. And we'll be right back with Kristen O'Donnell Tubb, award-winning author, to hear about the therapy dog in her new book, Luna Howls at the Moon. If your dad is anything like mine, he leads the pack. He is the alpha. He gets the job done. This Father's Day, give him the badge of honor he deserves with Alpha Dad, Dog Dad, or Pack Leader attire from the Jack Russell Parent Store. My favorite print, of course, is the Jack Russell Dad print because they may be the bravest dads of all. (laughs) Seriously. These awesome prints come on baseball t-shirts, hoodies, and even a coffee mug. Your choice. Hey, Dad, get ready, because your gift is about to arrive in the mail soon. To join the Dog Dad Squad, check out the rad gift options at JackRussellParents.com. Simply click on Shop at the top and place your order. Happy Father's Day to you, Dad. Today, joining us again is award-winning children's author, Kristen O'Donnell Tubb. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to join you guys again. Thank you for having me back. Yes, it's absolutely wonderful. We love talking about your awesome dog-centric middle grade novels. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I I love sharing them and um, sharing all types of stories. So I'm really grateful to be here. Aww. Well, before we get started, we have to ask, how is your adorable pug, Bad Myrtle, doing? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, she's tearing up the world. <laughs> Great. Thank you for asking. Oh, yeah. It's been rainy here in Nashville, so she has not had a W-A-L-K uh-huh. to be spelled Yeah, and for a couple of days. And so she's she's starting to look a little droopy. She's starting to have that really creased pug head. <laughs> I'm going to try to get her out later today if the rain stops for a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure she'll be ecstatic about that. <laughs> Previously, we talked to you about your books, A uh, Dog Named Daisy and Zeus Dog of Chaos. And make sure you all check out that service dog episode so you can hear about those awesome books as well. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for, for that conversation. Yeah. And today we have the privilege of learning all about your new book, Luna Howls at the Moon. And that drops on June 15th. Looking forward to it. We are so excited about this. So tell us about Luna's story. Yeah. So Luna Howls at the Moon is the story of Luna. Just like Daisy and Zeus, it is told from the dog's point of view, which is, as a writer, Becca, I know you know this, it's so much fun to explore worlds like that. Yeah. So Luna is the one who narrates the story, and she is a silver lab who serves as a therapy dog for a family counselor. So her human is Tessa, and Tessa has all of these clients, um, mostly children, mostly kids, tweens and teens. And Luna considers all of these kids also her clients and her humans as well. Her job (laughs) as a therapy animal is to comfort and calm them, um, which is what therapy animals um, do overall. And so um, the... There are four kids, um, Amelia, Beatrice, Caleb, and Hector, and they are placed in group therapy together, much to all of their chagrins. They, none of them <laughs> really want to do this. Yeah. So after the first meeting, Hector does not come back 
And when Tessa gets distracted, um, the other three decide that they're going to go find him and figure out why he's ditched them. So they go on a quest across Austin, Texas to find Hector. So Luna accompanies these three kids um, in their quest across Austin. That sounds amazing. So your previous books were about one dog helping one person. What made you decide to have the dog help multiple people in this story? I always feel like research for one book inspires story ideas for more books. The idea for Zeus Dog of Chaos definitely came from when I was doing research for A Dog Like Daisy. Awesome. And research is probably my favorite part of the writing process because I feel like a student again. I feel like I get to absorb all this new information and it's always exciting. What was occurring was when I was researching both Daisy and Zeus, I kept trying to define what is a service dog. There isn't really an official definition or certification out there. Real true service dogs have had a lot of training and they have um, specialties like um, Daisy specializes in assisting humans who are managing PTSD. Mm -hmm. Zeus specializes in managing, um, helping his human manage type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. As I was researching all of that, I kept coming across the term therapy animal as well. So therapy dog specifically, therapy, do therapy animals, they assist a number of humans. They don't just assist one human. So their job is to go into areas like nursing homes or hospitals or libraries, mm -hmm. or they help counselors, they help therapists. They assist a number of different people. And because of that, therapy dogs are trained a little bit differently than, than service dogs. Service dogs are trained for a specialty and therapy dogs are trained to kind of have this really broad, big view of experience of the world. So in other words, therapy dogs are trained for things like everything from how they react to say a person in a wheelchair to how they react to loud noises, like somebody dropping a platter full of food. Oh, wow. So their range of experience has to be very broad and they have to just kind of drift by <laughs> very calm throughout every bit of it, um, which is really interesting to me. Not every dog is able to stay calm across the board in every scenario. So that's what was really fascinating to me and what I wanted to explore a little bit more. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. And and that actually, you know, was was one of my next questions was what is the difference between like a medical or service alert dog and the therapy dog? But I feel like you just explained that really well. If there's anything else you want to add to that? Well, one thing I will say, like I touched on, is that not every therapy animal is a dog, although dogs are the most commonly used. There are such things as therapy pigs, ah! <laughs> therapy, oh gosh, what are some of the, oh, a peacock. Um, you may have seen in the news a few years ago, a woman tried to bring her peacock onto an airplane. Wow. Oh. <laughs> the tail would fill the whole cabin if it opened up. <laughs> yeah, it's a really fascinating field for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Becca always has to bring her therapy pig on, on the plane with her, but she has to buy me two seats. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, when you see these pictures of therapy pigs, I keep thinking like there's definitely a story in there to be told. Oh, oh for sure. And their best friend is a spider. Who would have thought? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so is there any real place like therapy dogs worldwide? Yes, there is. I changed the name. The traditional training framework for therapy dogs has been designed by an organization called Therapy Dogs International. Uh -huh. And I just tweaked that name a little bit just because I really, if if I get anything incorrect, I don't want it to reflect on them. I want it to reflect on me. Sure. Yeah. I'm very conscientious about that kind of thing. And I believe you can just search Therapy Dogs International or TDI is what I think they go by as well. Um, and it's fascinating. There's all sorts of guidelines um, online about how you can certify your pet as a therapy animal and possibly um, do things like visit hospitals or nursing homes. The, the line between 
um, pet and service animal is a little more distinct, but a therapy animal is usually also a pet. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I had um, I just seen on Facebook the other day um, an old friend of mine who had they have a little Frenchie. It's their second little Frenchie's cute little thing. And they made that a therapy dog for their son. Let's give uh, Carson another 10 years and he'll be chill enough to be a therapy dog. Yeah, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if you heard while I was answering that question, Myrtle was scratching at the door. <laughs> so he's definitely not chill enough to be a therapy pet for sure. Although she's really good at cuddling. Oh, well, that's we need that. We need that. Yeah. So this story is set in Austin, Texas. So why did you choose to set the story there? Uh, okay, true confession. I had never been to Austin and I really wanted to go. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, oh, well, I'll set a book there. But it's almost like the story universe has magic that goes on behind the scenes that writers and illustrators find only after the fact of of, oh, that's why Austin, Texas. And really mm -hmm. what happened was I found out that Austin has these amazing moon towers. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the historic moon towers in Austin, but there are, I believe, 13 of them that still are standing. And they were erected in Austin in the early to mid 1800s. And um, they were predecessors to streetlights. The reason why or the lore goes that Austin got these um, moon tower, uh, these huge moon towers, they look like cell towers, they're really, really tall, is because they had a serial killer. Oh, yes. And so the city bought these huge lights from Detroit and they installed them all over the city and people kind of freaked out about it. They thought that shining lights at night would confuse the chickens into laying too many <laughs> eggs. And they uh -huh. thought that it would bring on locusts. Wow. <laughs> they thought that it would basically have like biblical level retribution for shining lights during the moonlight. And so it's it was just kind of fascinating, the history of these, but there's still um, a really large moon tower in Zilker Park, which is just off the heart of downtown Austin. And that's where the quest leads them to. And I just really, yeah, you know, I just really liked the metaphor of them looking for the moon and her name being Luna. Mm -hmm. Like Luna is searching for herself in a way. Ah, I love that. <laughs> it, yeah, it really fit together in a way that I, afterwards I was very grateful that the, like I said, the story universe had pointed me toward Austin, primarily mm -hmm. because I wanted to um, go eat tacos and listen to good <laughs> music. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> it ended up being because of the moon towers. It was an excellent fit. That's so neat. Like, I love that, that backstory. That's incredible. So how else did you incorporate the spirit of Texas into your story? We're interested because, you know, we're Texans. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, well, I, I think the spirit of Texas inserts itself wherever it needs to be inserted, right? That sounds about right. Well said. <laughs> Especially in a city like Austin, the capital city, it's very distinct culture that you really kind of can't feel anywhere else. I noticed that everywhere in Austin, there are stars. And, you know, the, the name of the book and the name of the dog being Luna, I started taking yeah. pictures of these stars that are everywhere in Austin. And I mean, they are on the manhole covers, yeah. right? garbage cans, they are on bike racks, they're on door frames and door handles, they're inlaid in marble on the, <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> and it's just, they're beautiful, they're everywhere. There's just something about that kind of uniqueness that I really, I'm really drawn to cities that have that kind of flavor that that are really hard to put your finger on what it is that defines them but it really just kind of boils down to this awesome culture and diversity and story there's lots of story there yeah oh absolutely i think that actually is one of the things that surprised me the most about texas when we moved here is just people who haven't been here have this oh darn it <laughs> Oh my goodness. I'm happy to hear that, that barking. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> he wants to interject in the Texas conversation. So let me tell you how I feel about right? it. Right? Yeah. 
I love it. Carson, leave it. <laughs> we say that too. We say leave it, especially when I'm walking and there's um, somebody drives by on a bicycle. <gasps> yes. There's something about, she doesn't mess with cars or anything like that, but there's something about a bicycle that really just <laughs> her little pug mind. Yes. Carson is into garbage trucks and I've, I've been working on the leave it command. <laughs> Okay, well, about Austin. So when we first moved here, I think that was the thing about it that surprised me the most. Like this whole area is, it's not what I expected. People who've never been here before have this impression. They think Texas and all they think about is cowboy boots and horses and farming, you know, and that's fine because that is part of Texas, but there's so much more to it. It's it's a beautiful area too. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was the the quest that the kids end up taking. They walk along the lake. And they're yeah. just they're fascinating. I am going to take a minute. I'm so sorry. Sure. Myrtle in because she will just keep scratching at the door. <laughs> That's okay. Whatever. You I don't know. Wanting to inject themselves into this conversation for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you make them snorting and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a pug. He's in the background. <laughs> that's that's what you get when you have a pug and some heavy breathing. Oh my gosh, it's hilarious. <laughs> you have a therapy pig. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's <Wow>. yes. <laughs> Oh my goodness. No, this is exactly what we need is to hear mortal sounds. <laughs> oh man. Oh my goodness. This is completely off the rails. <clears throat> I love it. Oh wait, we're in Texas. We've fallen off the horse. And we've fallen off the horse, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh my god. Okay, so we have uh, just a couple more questions before we get to our Zoomies round. So this is of course more of an authory question, but what is the best feedback you have received from our reader? I recently got a message from a librarian who is in Oklahoma. One of her, I believe it was either fourth or fifth grade boys had picked up Zeus. And he came in and said, when he was returning it, and he said, I love this book so much. I'm going to go buy a copy. Aww. And then I'm going to read it over and over and over again. And then I'm going to read it to my kids. Oh, my goodness. Grandkids. And then when I die, I'm going to have a copy of it cremated with me. So I can <laughs> read it to kids in heaven. Stop oh. it. That's the best. Wow. I'm like, I can't, that's it. I've hit the pinnacle of my career. Right? <laughs> that is what it's all about. Yes. <laughs> oh, so I, I owe a huge, huge thank you to Julie Kreft. She's the librarian who sent me that, um, that review. And I... I, I'm it just it made it it made my career like I said it's so I just love it so much oh that I'm so excited for you that's wonderful I love it yeah thank you <laughs> and that's the dream right absolutely who you want to love your book and that's that's what's really special about them. yeah that's great and so for Luna what message do you hope the readers will connect with the most that makes them want to read it to kids in heaven <laughs> You know, I, I actually just got, which is really great, an awesome um, Kirkus review on Luna. And they said something about that they were happy to see. Sorry, there goes Myrtle yawning. Um, <laughs> she's not nearly as enchanted with all of, of my oh talking. Uh, they said that Luna was, um, they were happy to see that it addressed mental health and the uniqueness of what makes us each individual and unique and how that was celebrated in the story. And I loved that because it really felt like they understood what I was trying to do with Luna, that they really understood that I was trying to look at counseling being healthy and mm -hmm. mental health being something that we need to take care of for ourselves as much as physical health. And that's definitely something that I would love to, um, I hope is highlighted when people are sharing this story. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I, I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of this book and read it because I loved Zeus so, so very much. So when and where can listeners get all your books, but especially Luna Howls at the Moon? Luna Howls at the Moon comes out June 15th. 
but you can pre-order it, which means that you can go ahead and place an order for it and it will arrive at your house on the 15th, usually, sometimes, you know, shipping. Sure. But, um, so you can go ahead and pre-order it. And Luna is available through uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, but I just so happen to be kind of running this special deal where if you order it through an independent bookstore, um, any independent bookstore, and then email me your receipt, I will send you a gift. Aww. Pins. Yeah. And the three pins represent Daisy. It's a little Daisy pin. Zeus, which is a lightning bolt pin. And Luna, which is a little crescent moon pin. Oh, I love oh, that. Great. And if you pre-order it specifically from Parnassus, which is my um, local independent bookstore here in Nashville. I can also sign and personalize those copies for you. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, I, I just love that. I love the pins. I love the signing in. It makes it that much more special. I'm grateful to Parnassus that, um, that I'm able to do that. I'm really sorry about Myrtle making so much noise. <laughs> I'm going to take a moment and howl at the coffee pot while you enjoy this commercial break. Aloha Mama Apparel wants to spread the spirit of aloha. Genesis Belote, the creator of Aloha Mama Apparel, was born on the mainland and resides in Southern California. But she cherishes her Hawaiian culture and honors the half of her family that lives on the island. She loves being a mama and a designer. At Aloha Mama, they know being a mama is hard work, but it's the best work. That's why they style mamas and kiddos in apparel that is bright and filled with beachy vibes. For the cutest casual attire celebrating the spirit of Aloha, go to shopalohamama.com. That's shop, A-L-O-H-A-M-A-M-A.com. Shopalohamama.com. We are back with children's author, Kristen O'Donnell Tubb, and we are psyched for our Zoomies round of questions. Are you ready, Kristen? Yes, I am ready. I'm ready for Zooming. <laughs> Myrtle and I are both ready. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So do you prefer hot dogs or corn dogs? Hot dogs. As a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, an astronaut. <laughs> and I always kind of jokingly say that I, I made it from astronaut to author, so I never made it out of the career options that begin with A. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, maybe you'll write a book about a dog that went into space. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So how would you describe yourself in one word? Uh, optimistic. Nice. Besides your own, what is your favorite dog book? Love That Dog by Sharon Creech. Oh my gosh, that book. Sharon Creech is my favorite. I've not read that particular book, but now I'm going to have to. It is amazing. It is amazing. It's uh, it's in verse and it just, I mean, I wish you could see me now. Like I am like gripping my heart. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, I'm going to order it. All like, right. What would you rather do perform in a circus or in an aquatic dance group? In a circus. <laughs> and, and what would you do in a circus? It's probably something like trip, uh, like, trapeze or something like that. I, I, cool. I'm kind of a thrill seeker. I love zip lining. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And lastly, does writing energize or exhaust you? Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say more energized than exhaust though. Um, and I will also say that I feel like the drafting process energizes me and the revising process <laughs> exhausts me. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is so awesome. Kristen, we appreciate your time and thank you for being here with us today. And we wish you so much success with Luna, House at the Moon, and just in your future career because I see it going and going and going. So, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys and how much you love dogs and <laughs> shows with your patience as Myrtle snorts and snores here next to me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. We, I really appreciate anybody who um, highlights the amazing things that dogs offer us yeah. and what we can do for them. 
Gabe, I love all the deep layers of meaning behind Kristen's storytelling, and I'm so excited to read this next book, and I hope you will snag your copy too. Let's show her some love for creating such fun and enlightening stories for your kids. We hope you and your fur children have a peacefully motivated week. Did you enjoy this episode? Did you learn from the content? Or did you just have a good, relatable laugh? Well, now what? It's time to subscribe, follow, keep listening, and give a positive review on the Apple Podcast app. Then share the podcast with other puppy parents. This will allow us to connect you and your friends with fun, dog-loving content week after week. Until next time, this is Becca and Gabe, the Jack Russell parents. Say bye, Carson. (laughs) We'd love to connect with you online at jackrussellparents.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at JRT Podcasts. That's at JRT for Jack Russell Terrier Podcast. The Jack Russell Parents Podcast is produced by Earball Audio. Jack Russell Parents is brought to you in part by Super Chewer. From the makers of BarkBox, Super Chewer is a themed monthly delivery of toys and treats made especially for dogs who play harder and demand a challenge. Simply go to jackrussellparents.com and click the Super Chewer link to enjoy their great offers while also supporting our podcast. Mm